To most people, the conifers, pine, spruce, fir, and others, are symbols of the far north and high mountain peaks. And for good reason. These trees dominate the boreal ecosystems of North America and Eurasia, as well as the alpine forests that blanket high mountains. But why exactly is this? Why don't conifers blanket the Amazon rainforest? And why do they cover Siberia, Canada, and high elevations? To understand why conifers dominate cold regions, we should first understand why they've been largely pushed out of warm regions. The competitors of the conifers, angiosperms or flowering plants, first arose in the Mesozoic. By the late Cretaceous, they likely dominated the tropics and monsoon regions. The evolutionary advantages angiosperms have over conifers in certain environments are numerous, far too numerous to describe in detail. But here are two very important ones. First, there's pollination. All conifers are wind pollinated. They make an enormous amount of light pollen, which floats through the air to fertilize other trees. Although some angiosperms are also wind pollinated, many use animals for pollination, especially in the tropics and monsoon regions. They make a very conservative amount of heavy, sticky pollen that insects or other animals carry to the next flower. This type of pollination may seem too specialized and unreliable at first glance, but overall it has paid off evolutionarily. In wet climates in particular, it's a much better strategy because if the rain washes out all the light, wind-blown pollen, it's worthless. Much better to have a pollinator carry it directly to the target. Another important factor is cell size. During the Cretaceous, flowering plants tended to downsize their genome allowing for smaller cells and faster cell division. Smaller cells can be packed in greater number into a given leaf area, allowing for more gas exchange, which would allow for higher rates of photosynthesis. From the Mesozoic until about three million years ago, the Earth tended to be much warmer and wetter than it is today. As a result, conifers were increasingly pushed to the fringes. Nevertheless, they persisted in specific environments. The rock you're looking at here is called Triassic Sandstone, derived from the Durham Basin in central North Carolina. During the Triassic period, a wide basin ran from what's now Durham down to Wadesboro, sitting in the shadow of a great mountain range. Coursing rivers from these high mountains filled the basin with sediment, which in time formed sandstone. It's nice looking rock, and easily shaped into stones used for buildings like this Episcopal Church. But hidden within this seemingly homogeneous, brick-like rock are traces of a lost world. Some of the most important Triassic period fossils have been found within it, including great predators like Postosuchus. But along with animal remains, the rivers also deposited plants, including fossil remains that may belong to the oldest member of the Panaceae, the family of conifers which today dominates the north and the high mountains. The high mountains around the Durham Basin stretched northeast to what's now Scotland, where more conclusive Panaceae fossils have been found from the late Jurassic. Altogether, this strongly suggests that the Panaceae originated in these mountains, possibly adapting to the cold of high elevations at a time when the global climate was mostly warm. But these trees would remain evolutionary underdogs for millions of years. That is, until the climate cooled dramatically around three million years ago. As the climate cooled and subtropical species were kicked out of high latitudes, the Panaceae, pine, spruce, fir, larch, and hemlock began to dominate the northern forests. Some members of the Supressaceae, like junipers, cedars, and cypress, followed suit. These conifers had unique advantages over the tree species they replaced. What are those advantages exactly? For one, it's the vascular system. Angiosperms tend to have much larger conduits through which water and nutrients can flow. This allows for high growth rates and high turnover of leaves. But there's a major downside to these wide conduits, a phenomenon called freeze-thaw embolism. When the vascular system of the tree starts to thaw out after a long, very cold winter, air bubbles start to form. And in large conduits, large air bubbles form. 
Due to their large size, they don't easily dissolve back into solution, leading to an embolism. Conifers, on the other hand, have a vascular system composed of very narrow trachids. The narrow shape only allows very tiny bubbles to form, which quickly dissolve back into solution, preventing an embolism. The width of the tubes in the vascular system of plants is the key factor determining whether or not a freeze-thaw embolism will occur. In addition, most of the conifers in cold regions use special molecules to preserve their chlorophyll instead of letting it break down in cold temperatures. When the warmth in spring arrives, they can immediately begin photosynthesizing, while the deciduous trees need time to grow new leaves. The shorter and cooler the growing season, the more this comes in handy. The conifer advantage is strengthened dramatically in climates with a summer dry season and a cold winter, like much of the mountainous U.S. west of the Rockies. A deciduous tree like a maple would prefer to get its growing done during a warm, wet summer and then go dormant for the winter. But a dry summer ruins that strategy entirely, because just as the maple tree grows some decent-sized leaves by summer, the water disappears. Conifers, on the other hand, can immediately start growing in spring using the snowmelt. For this reason, most of the deciduous trees in the high elevations of the western U.S. are found near streams or other permanent sources of water. Another interesting conifer advantage is found in foggy regions. Conifer needles act like perfect fog condensers, turning unusable water in the air into water that can be used for growth. When fog condenses on a conifer needle, the tiny water droplets are more likely to coalesce into a large water droplet, which will fall onto the forest floor and water the tree. Fog that condenses on wide leaves, on the other hand, is more likely to remain in tiny droplets that evaporate. In general, thick advection fog occurs when true rainfall doesn't, making this advantage particularly strong in areas prone to advection fog, like the Pacific Northwest in summer or the shores of Lake Superior in spring. Under the redwoods of coastal California, almost a third of the quote-unquote rainfall is actually fog drip from the trees. In tension zones between coniferous and deciduous forests, like the Great Lakes region or the High Appalachians, poor soil lends an advantage to the conifers. On poor soil, natural selection favors plants which have a very low biomass turnover rate. They hold on to their foliage for as long as possible to save nutrients. To reduce turnover, the foliage needs more chemical and physical defenses against weather and animals. Conifer needles accomplish this to a greater degree than maple or oak leaves, and thin, rocky soil is common in the far north, where past ice sheets have scraped down to the bedrock. So in short, cold, fog, and poor soil tend to favor conifers over angiosperms. Larger oceans and smaller continents in the southern hemisphere haven't forced conifers like the podocarps to adapt to the kind of extreme cold seen in Canada or Siberia. In fact, there are altitudes of New Zealand's mountains where native trees never grew, but invasive conifers from the northern hemisphere have taken root. Before invasive species were considered a major threat to biodiversity, northern conifers were planted in New Zealand's mountains for forestry purposes. All these trees were members of the Panay Initially, the trees did poorly because no one knew they needed a symbiotic mycorrhizal fungi. But after the fungi were introduced, the trees took off. They now grow at much higher elevations than native trees, and they've begun to replace the old tussock grasslands that once dominated the high elevations. Terrible as it may be for the ecosystem of New Zealand, this really goes to show just how well adapted the Panaceae are to extreme cold. In a warming world, the future of the Panaceae seems uncertain, but for now, they remain an emblem of a harsh and unforgiving boreal world. Thanks for watching.